Welcome back to Real Clear Radio Hour, brought to you by the Competitive Enterprise Institute. I'm your host, Bill Frezza. For the second half of our show, we're pleased to be joined by Frank Buckley, Foundation Professor at George Mason University School of Law, frequent contributor to the American Spectator, and author of The Once and Future King, The Rise of Crown Government in America. Frank, welcome to the show. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Frank, you're an expert on the history of constructing constitutions. You've written a very interesting book that's a half a romp through history and half looking at contemporary problems. Roll us back and set the stage. When the founders sat down to craft our constitution, what were their biggest worries? Well, they were worried about a couple of things. Mostly what they didn't want was George III. Hmm. I mean, they had seen George III. They just fought a war about George III. That's the last thing they wanted. So they gave us a constitution where they thought, we're not going to have that kind of problem. And you know, by the way, these guys are the smartest, most astute students of government you'll ever find. And their debates are just the most wonderful story of America. You get into it in the book, and it, it really is quite fascinating. Yeah, but they're, you know, they're, they're 18th century people. And what does that mean? Well, they don't feel about democracy the way we do. Mm-hmm. I mean, there are mobs running around Philadelphia. And in the middle of the convention... This old woman gets stoned as a witch. I mean, we talk, we think Age of Enlightenment, witches, but that's the reality of what's going on. And Th- then they This is right George in the streets of, the, of Philadelphia. Five blocks from Independence Hall where they're meeting, right in the middle of the debates. And the day after she dies, they have to vote on, will we have an elected president? And boy, that's, they didn't want that. Mm. So they didn't want what we ended up with, but they just weren't omniscient. They, they didn't foresee what would happen you know, 225 years down the road. Who can blame them? They were very much making it up as they, were, as they were going along. But they are credited with separation of powers doctrine, which in your book you say sort of grew organically. It wasn't really designed in. Well, it was, I think, a strategic ploy more than anything. Here's what pretty much everybody in the convention knew. We're not going to have an elected president. If you showed them the constitution we have now under which we operate, mm-hmm. they'd say, no, that, 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 that's the last thing we want. They had four votes on, shall we elect our president? And it lost every time. And what they ended up with was, was a compromise. They were compromising all over the place. And the hidden heroes, the guys who made the deal, were not the people that we hear about. It wasn't Madison. It wasn't Hamilton. They were, mm-hmm. they were more outliers. It was the, the guys behind the scene. In many ways, some of the most fascinating people there, people like Governor Morris, and realizing that they couldn't get an elected president, which they wanted because they knew it would strengthen the national mm-hmm. government, they ended up with a compromise, and it, it, it looked like separation of powers. And you know what? The theorists love that because it sounds like highfalutin mm-hmm. theory, but it's not really what drove them. And what drove them was more, we don't want George III. It was the proximate fear of what they'd just been through that colored all their perspective. Yeah, and the guys who thought it up, and the guy who really thought it up was Gouverneur Morris. He's the guy who introduced it right in the middle of it. And it was a brilliant strategic ploy to try to bring everybody on side. Uh, But they didn't foresee modernity. They, They didn't foresee democracy. They didn't foresee that we'd have an election where you'd have a national candidate. You know what? They thought after George Washington, there'd never be one person who'd command a majority of the Electoral College. And that's not the way we are. The last such election was 1824. Yeah, so so they actually thought that most elections would be thrown to Congress. Most elections, they thought, would be thrown to the House of Representatives voting by state. And the, the, the state's rights types there thought they had won. So in a sense, they were building a parliamentary form of government. It was much closer to parliamentary. I guess I'd, the better term is probably congressional because there was, was going to be a president. Mm-hmm. But first of all, they, they didn't think that we'd have a very broad federal government, and they didn't think the executive would have all that much discretion. Here's the way they thought it would work. Congress is going to write the laws, and you give it to the president, and he just executes, and he doesn't really have much authority mm-hmm. the way he does it. But for fighting wars and the like, which George Washington had to do, it's, it's not going to be a very powerful presidency, and all the action would be in Congress. When you talk about the fear of democracy and the fear of the mobs, you talk about a concept of filtering elections, multiple stages of electors, electing electors, and so on. Describe yeah. that. Well, the idea is the people are too simple. 
to figure out who to vote for. Number one, they're misled by demagogues. And number two, somebody in South Carolina will never know anything about anybody in Massachusetts. So, you, you know, you won't get national people. So this is the 18th century version of low information voter. Yeah, really, to the power of 10. And people less informed as well, generally. Uh, you know, there are newspapers, but they're often scurrilous rags. So, yeah, very much low information. But then what happens is you vote for the guys in the House, and the guys in the House would end up choosing the president. Actually, the initial idea of filtration was Madison's, and he bored it from David Hume. And that really didn't commend itself much to the delegates. You know, Madison's plans didn't really go anywhere. But the, the whole idea is, you know, elect the lower level, lower level elects a higher level, you know, that mm -hmm. level elects a president, something like that. But we eventually got direct election of senators, which was not in the original Constitution. We ultimately got direct election of the of the president through this strange yep. contraption, which, which gives uh, states different uh, number of electoral votes. And how did the office evolve, and when did it really take off as a central power? Well, it was a gradual evolution, and it wasn't all Obama. I mean, uh, George W. Bush's thumbprints are all over the, you know. I would say FDRs are as well. So FDR, <laughs> certainly. Uh, Woodrow Wilson, Teddy Roosevelt, you know, you just, uh, and, and Abraham Lincoln. So it's been gradually building. There was a jump start with the New Deal. And then in the last 10 years, in the last couple of administrations, just a, a great expansion. The war on terror, the Department of Homeland Security mm -hmm. was created by executive order under George Bush. And then under Obama, particularly after the Republicans took the House in 2010-11. So, right, you know, right now you have the specter of Obama creating laws by executive order, essentially, mm -hmm. as if he had a legislative power. And not enforcing laws he doesn't like, which is really remarkable. I mean, there's this very finely crafted provision in the Constitution. If the president doesn't like a bill, he can veto it, but then he can be overridden by two-thirds of the Senate. And that happens. And at that point, he's obliged to execute the law. Well, you tell me. That depends on whether the Constitution is binding. You see, I don't know how much of the Constitution that people read still is really the Constitution, apart from one part of it. Maybe mm -hmm. about the only thing left to our Constitution, at least which describes the federal government, is that section, Article 2, Section 1, Clause 1, saying the president has to be elected every four years. And then after that, he does what he wants. Well, I understand now that there are 2.5 million people working in the executive branch in the federal agencies, and that doesn't include the military. Yeah, absolutely right. I live in the Washington area, and uh, we're, we're doing very well, thank you. Housing Price is doing great. And all those operatives are really under the control of one person. To a large extent. Well, what's the alternative? The alternative might be a bureaucracy that did whatever the heck it wanted, which would be worse still. So you have to have somebody controlling them. And the way the government is structured through czars, uh, recess appointments, and political appointees, and then your average ambitious bureaucrat like Lois Lerner, Boy, you've got a highly centralized form of government. Talk a little bit about the creation of czars, when that started. Uh, does it go back to FDR with his... It with goes back certainly to Nixon, Jerry Ford. Mm -hmm. Further back than that, I don't know. Bill Simon was the energy czar. Mm -hmm. And that term really originated from that period in 1970. From the Nixon Prior to that, you were talking about something called the Brains Trust under FDR. But mm -hmm. Bill Simon was the first person, I think, called czar. Now there are, there are about 40 of them with, with, with President Obama. And these people don't require congressional approval. That's correct. And you know what? That, that's not surprising. That's just sort of the history of modern democracy. I mean, every modern democracy, presidential, parliamentary, it's not cabinet government. It's ruled by the chief executive, prime minister, president. So cabinet meetings, basically, they're, they're not discussion forums. Rather, it's more like the CEO telling subordinates, here's the program, get with it. From where do the czars draw their power? What legislation gives them power? Well, none, but except, well, <laughs> Article 2, Section 1, Clause 1, the president will be elected every four <laughs> That's years. It. That's it. And That's it, yeah. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about the various boards that have been set up from the Consumer uh, Financial Protection Bureau to the Independent Payment, Payment Advisory Board. There seem to be a number of boards taking on lives of their own. 
There are, and you know what's interesting about that is Congress seems to be consciously abdicating any oversight functions and giving broad discretion to the bureaucrats, you know, as managed by the president. Congress has to approve appointments, but the convention that you defer to the president's choice is so strong that pretty much he can decide what he wants. So you, you know, there, there's a tendency to depoliticize things by turning it over to an independent board, but that has the effect really of strengthening presidential power. I understand the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau gets $400 million a year from the Federal Reserve and Congress is prohibited from reviewing the budget? Right. What is that? Well, the idea is you don't want politics to intrude into what should be an exercise in pure public spirited government. And if you believe that, I got a bridge to sell you. <laughs> but, but, you know, that's roughly the idea. I mean, what people are thinking of is what happens. Um, you know, senators making phone calls saying, I've got an interest in this particular problem. Mm -hmm. And, um, so they, they they wanted to ensure that wouldn't happen, but at the same time, they, they were handing over the, the reins to a large extent to the president. Talk about the way prosecutorial discretion is used to advance the agenda of the executive. What's the most dangerous thing going? America isn't Russia, or even close. It's not New Zealand, is it? So this country is remarkable for the number of laws it has, literally uncountable. And also the extent to which it has done away with what lawyers call mens rea, the requirement that there be a guilty mind. And we've talked about this on the show before. Yeah. So you put those two together, and then the only other thing you need is a highly politicized Department of Justice. We or, don't get that you know, now. Right? IRS. And, you know, <laughs> heaven forfend that this should ever happen here, right? So once you get that, then you got people like Dinesh D'Souza pleading guilty to some charge or other. At that point, it's really, uh, show me the man and I'll show you the crime. I mean, as, as Harvey Silverglade has pointed out, we're, you know, we're all felons potentially. It's just whether they want to go after us. This is a theme that seems to be, to be recurring. What role does the media play in, uh, in setting the hounds loose on targets of prosecution or making a star out of the chief executive? Well, you know, from my perspective, they, I think they're all monarchists. I mean, I get, they love the idea of crown government. They love the idea of, I don't know what it is. They love the idea of having an ideological soulmate, perhaps, in the office. But, but more than that, I guess if you're in the media, you have a vested interest in making rock stars out of leaders, whatever the politics. Mm -hmm. and or demons, so, if it's the other party. I think that's an aspect of the problem. The Bush derangement syndrome of 10 years back, I see that as a, an example of a very unhealthy fixation on the president. I mean, the idea is we're supposed to love the guy, and if we don't love them, we hate him like a frustrated mm -hmm. lover would. It's part of the particular problem of presidential government where you make the head of state the head of government. And one of the virtues of a, of a parliamentary system is the head of state is the queen, and Prince Charles talks to plants. <laughs> yeah. he's, he's got jug ears, but you know, he won't sick the IRS on you. That's true. Whereas if you have a president who is the head of state, why, if there's a national tragedy, he has to give a healing speech, and Peggy Noonan is going to write a tearful op-ed about it in the Wall Street Journal. So the ceremonial, you're saying the ceremonial duties of the head of state. It matters psychologically. Hmm. It really does. And, you know, people make fun of people's devotion to the queen and all that and, and royal visits, but a uh, heck of a lot safer. And by the way, a heck of a lot cheaper. Your book talks a lot about crisis government. And of course, there's the famous Rahm Emanuel quote about never letting a crisis go to waste. Yeah. How is that used to ratchet up uh, the executive? Yeah, some people think... Well, there inevitably will be crises, and we need a president to deal with them. And I, I just don't buy that argument, because the kind of leaders who get elevated to positions of power during a crisis, people like Lincoln accepted, tend to be people who hang on to power thereafter. So it's a very dangerous kind of a game. Besides that, there's kind of a political economy of crises here. Mm -hmm. I mean... <laughs> A crisis is supposed to be something that's unanticipated, 
but you can anticipate crises in America. That's what FEMA is all about, <laughs> right? They're in the business of finding crises. And, you know, by the way, we get a lot more crises just before an election. Yeah. Yeah. The, what the, a timing, is, the timing is quite a coincidence. You talk about the leveling influence of forcing a prime minister to go before parliament and have – have him uh, put up with catcalls and criticisms compared to the State of the Union address where the chief executive waltzes into the slap of cameras, gives an imperial speech, and, and leaves. Compare the two. Well, the, the parliamentary version of State of the Union is what is called the speech from the throne, where the queen goes to parliament in Westminster and reads a, a very, very dull speech written by the prime minister, saying, here's my platform. And... Uh, it doesn't even have the pomp and circumstance of the State of the Union. I mean, we have no lessons to take from the Brits on ceremonies. I mean, we do it real well. <laughs> but the crucial difference is the prime minister is more or less obliged to meet Parliament when he's in town regularly and take questions. And some of the questions might seem foolish, but the point is, it's the opposition that gets to choose the questions. Hmm. So something like, say, Benghazi, there would have been a month of debates in a House of Commons over Benghazi. The opposition wouldn't have let that issue go away. So right now, there's a select committee looking at it. But that was, what, 18 months ago? Mm -hmm. And to quote Hillary Clinton at this point, what difference does it make? No, they, they can wear you out by, well, by they, just they, pushing it off. That's exactly right. I mean, Clinton avoided conviction in the Senate by just holding on to proceedings mm -hmm. until he could make Ken Starr the, the villain. But if you were in Parliament, it wouldn't be so easy. You, you know, uh, uh, by the way, Obama showed up at the Indian Parliament at one point, the Lok Sabha. Hmm. And he brought his teleprompter. And the Indian parliamentarians are saying, what the heck is this? We have never seen this. Right? Really? Yeah. You, you never do that in parliament. It's, it, it, would be, it, it would be a bit of a joke. It would be an insult. Which is why that plus the fact that the president is, is a head of state explains why you, you make him a larger-than-life figure. Whereas, you know, in a parliamentary regime, they're buffoons. If you look at the mechanisms of one-man rule, we've seen a lot of programs like We Can't Wait, yep. I Have a Pen and a Phone. How has that played out? Well, there's been a gradual expansion of power, particularly, as I say, since, since the Republicans took the House uh, in January 2011. And what that did is it accelerated presidential government because the president at this point realized, I can't get legislation through, so I'm going to have to do it on my own not having to worry much about the Constitution. What keeps impeachment from working? What keeps impeachment from working is one really simple change to the Constitution introduced by Governor Morris right at the end. It was a change so subtle that nobody noticed. Up to that point, to get a conviction and removal meant 50% in the Senate, and he changed that to two-thirds. It was so late in the day, nobody paid attention. And since then, there's been exactly one case in American history where you have the president of one party and two-thirds of a Senate in the other party. The trivia question is, when was that? And the answer is 1868. So the preconditions are, are never there. The original version of impeachment before that two-thirds majority change was more like a vote of confidence, which occurs frequently in parliamentary systems. Yep. Exactly right. And imagine what it would have been like if it had been 50%. And here, here again... 1998-99, the Clinton impeachment. Clinton was impeached. The vote on removal in the Senate was 50 votes to remove him, to convict him. Mm -hmm. At which point, it would have been kicked over to the vice president, Al Gore. And wouldn't it have been fun to see what he would have done? <laughs> well, I think we know what he would have done. He, would just, he just would have <laughs> had to live with it, that's all. By the way, you mentioned votes of non-confidence in the House. Here's the thing about parliamentary system, which is it's more like a corporate form of government in that it's really the party in control. The party is like a very powerful board of directors and the mm -hmm. prime minister is like a CEO. So when you lose power, it's like Maggie Thatcher in, in 1990. It's the party that, that gets the hook out. So what role do the courts have to play in all this? The courts can fine-tune things, but they've not been very effective. And in part, they look like a referee that yearns to award 
a 15 yard penalty against the team that's down 49 nothing in the half <laughs> they apply this abstract doctrine of separation of powers not realizing that what the framers practical people the all of them nearly wanted was a sense of the political balance what the supreme court has missed is the cards are being held by the president right now besides that the courts have a tendency to defer to the executive or, or to both branches over political issues and finally consider the court a 5-4 conservative court people say right now but what the court will look like in 10 years mm -hmm. would be very different citizens united campaign finance people are talking about it right now imagine that we have a democratic president for the next 10 years i would anticipate Citizens United being, if not overturned or completely scrapped, then very severely abridged. The law made by the Supreme Court is more like a temporary law than anything else. So if the courts are not going to serve as a bulwark to protect citizens from the unitary executive, what will? Well, there are two things that one has to do. And, and, and by way of prefacing this, a lot of people talk about constitutional amendments, uh, constitutional conventions. It's just not going to happen. We have to imagine fixes, if fixes exist, within the current system. And there are only two places you can look to. One is Congress, and the other is the voters. As far as Congress, Congress has to clean up its act. And as far as the voters are concerned, they have to have a sense of, beyond the issue of the day, of constitutional structures, of the desire for limited government. I haven't seen all that much of either. Suppose the tide turns and we end up with a uh, Republican administration, Republican uh, Congress uh, after 2016. Do you think things will get better or worse? Not clear. There are a lot of conservatives who, you might call them national greatness conservatives, mm -hmm. who aren't worried about excessive presidential power. They're just waiting for their turn at the bat. So where is their hope? I'd like to see Congress, as I say, clean up its act. And there's one way in which that can happen, and it happened already. It happened in 1994 with a contract with America. And bear in mind, I'm, I'm not trying to speak politically or in mm -hmm. a partisan way right now. I don't care who the president is or what party he belongs to. I just say whoever they are, they've got too much power. Now, what Newt Gingrich did in 1994 was he nationalized an election. And we haven't seen much of that since then with, with current leadership in, in, in Congress. But what you need is a platform in which you appeal to all Americans across the board, not just to the speaker's district, someplace mm -hmm. in Ohio I never heard of, but all across the country in, in a very clear way. And it worked once. That would be necessary. And the other thing is, as far as the voters are concerned, uh, I think we need a greater, I don't know what to call it, educational initiative on, on constitutional principles, on the idea that uh, we didn't want George III and there was a reason, and what the framers wanted was something very different. I, th I think, God knows that's not well taught. Frank, we're lucky that people even know we have a constitution, much less <laughs> understand its roots. Uh, Article 2, Section 1, Clause yeah, 1. You're just going to glaze their <laughs> eyes over. Well, Frank, I, I appreciate you coming on the show. The book was a fascinating read. Thanks for being with us. Thanks so much. It was a ball. Appreciate it. That wraps up our show for this week. We've been talking to Frank Buckley from George Mason Law School, author of The Once and Future King, The Rise of Crown Government in America, here on Real Clear Radio Hour, brought to you by the Competitive Enterprise Institute. I'm your host, Bill Frezza. Catch us next week, same time, same station, on Bloomberg Boston and WROM Detroit. See you then.